Welcome to Future Customer Value, where global thought leaders share their career-defining moments. Welcome, everyone, to the latest episode of Future Customer Value. We've got a very special guest today. I'm super excited about this, not only because of who our guest is, but the companies he's worked for and his experiences will immediately resonate to probably every single audience member who's listening to this. So welcome to the show, Jim Mercer. How's it going, Thank Jim? You so much. Thank you so much, um, Sagar. It's a great opportunity. Um, you know, I'm just one of many CS professionals out there, but, you know, with all humility, very much appreciate the opportunity and, uh, yeah, and digging in on some of the details here. Awesome. Well, I'll kick it off with a journey through your career over the past 15, 20 years. Jim, being a native of California, uh, left college and joined a very early stage startup, as people do in the in the Bay Area, a startup called Expert City back in the day. It was a 26-person startup. And I think you were there for only eight or nine months before you had this seismic shift and you were acquired by Citrix uh, within a year of you joining and ended up joining a 12,000 person employee company, which is, you know, well-known name brand and ended up, Jim ended up staying at Citrix for, for nearly uh, 15 years, right? And a long time, I, yes. a long time <laughs> <laughs> working in customer success the whole time, which is also cool because back in the day, I don't think people called it customer success. So it's, uh, you've been in the game for a while and, and Jim was running and account management teams, customer success teams at Citrix uh, across the enterprise and called it CS for Enterprise at the time. Um, did that for 15 years and then joined another uh, startup at the at the end of his tenure there, which at the time probably many people didn't know about, but it was a company called Zoom, right? And joined Zoom back in 2015, was the manager of customer success with three people on the team at the time. And Jim was at Zoom through the, the most famous era, infamous era with the pandemic, but with a Zoom becoming a global name, the Zoom boom with hundreds of millions of users joining the platform over that time. And Jim oversaw the entire post-sales organization, which grew to over 500 folks, including uh, CSMs, operations folks, and everybody who is supporting, supporting customers. So tons of great experiences there. Very excited to dig in and learn more about that. And now Jim is uh, taking a career break to focus on private investing, consulting opportunities, and figuring out what the next uh, the next uh, unicorn startup to join is. So thank you so much, Jim, again, for, for being on the show. And would love to have you share anything you'd like at this stage um, about your current state before we dive into the questions. Man, you did such a good job. I I, I feel like I, I don't need to say anything. No, it's to, 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 um, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, what you mentioned as it relates to, um, especially what I'm doing now, just at an interesting point in my career, it's, it's I would say, for lack of a better way of putting it, it's, it's pretty exciting, especially with some unknowns. And um, as you alluded to, um, you know, I did resign from Zoom last summer, but, you know, with that, th there was some immediate challenge with an immediate family member that was in hospice care. So really winding down almost like overnight, um, um, you know, going all in on the family, as it were. Um, it has had a lot of silver linings and and um, one being uh, the obvious, you know, being 100% all in on the family and really focusing on that situation at hand, but professionally and kind of tangentially um, really allowing me to kind of pause as it relates to what I would normally be doing in the full-time arena um, and looking at some of these, you know, outside opportunities through investing and, and some consulting work and, and things of that nature, which is really kept me sharpened and plugged in um, to different facets of the business, which has been a ton of fun. But I do know at some point soon I will be digging in and finding that next full-time opportunity, most likely, you know, over the course of the, the next several months. But um, yeah, in the end, like I said, great to be here. Great recap of kind of my my professional journey. I, I will layer in some context and um, and some other details. But yeah, like I said, super happy to be here. Awesome. Well, we are too. This podcast is brought to you by Foresight a full-service value realization platform designed to help you unlock growth in every single account. For more information on Foresight, please email them at info at gainforesight.co. That is info at G-A-I-N-F-O-R-E-S-I-G-H-T dot C-O. And they'll be in touch. Well, let's kick off, Jim, with a walk down memory lane to your first role at the startup, which was acquired by by Citrix Expert City. Yeah. So it, it, take us take us back to that world and tell us, you know, 
what did you learn going from a small startup into this massive enterprise? And really curious about this whole CS for enterprise yep. uh, mentality that you were you were in. Yeah, th um, thank you. And I walk down memory lane is no joke. I do feel like I've gotten into my you know virtual DeLorean here and literally have gone back to the future because every time I do talk about it, it feels like so long ago. And I guess it was. So thinking about, um, and, and I will clarify a couple of details around where and when and things of that nature. But at that time, you know, late nineties, I, uh, you know, close to graduation from college, um, was actually in Santa Barbara. Um, and that's, you know, um, on the side note, that's where I met my wife on a blind date. So a lot of good things when you take a look back that really happened that helped shape not only my career, but my personal life as well. Um, some good things in Santa Barbara happening at that time. So, um, like I said, I, I, found this cool company and and actually found it the the semester before I graduated and just a cool technology company in this incubator in a small town called Goleta just north of Santa Barbara and um you know some really what I call slick technology around remoting into desktops and it almost at that time it was like mind blowing having this screen sharing technology like what is this you know magical voodoo happening that I can see, go over the shoulder remotely and see someone's desktop and and as I talk about um, these things, these were the core technology around what came to be our core product base at that time. Go to my PC, um, go to meeting, go to assist and a slew of other products that came to Vogue over, over the course of the next several years at that time. Um, and when you think about just software as a service in general um, during that time too, you know, salesforce.com was relatively new, you know, two, three, four years old. Um, we were competing. The competitive landscape is interesting in that, like at that time, even out of the box software that, um, you know, uh, PC Anywhere, I'm remembering Timbuk2 was another one, like in addition to new players such as WebEx in that space as well, we were kind of competing with just a kind of like a, a renaissance period of software as a whole, going from like static out of the box, like put the disk in the drive and install it. To, to literally having, you know, seamless workflows around download in that online um, instantaneous experience. So, you know, going from that, you know, starting you know, literally being the first person on this post-sale team and really having a leader at that time that, you know, allowed and provided a lot of autonomy just to kind of help define the space as a whole. And, and when I say this space and, you know, uh, Salesforce is a good example where, when you think about in the context of software as a service, like over time, we think about subscription-based revenue, um, you know, like these initial baby steps, as it were, new foundations about keeping customers happy, happy proactively engaging customers, right? Um, trying to anticipate and navigate um, um, things like renewals and ensuring that there's no surprises. And you think about like, these are like the building blocks of like customers. For sure. Right? And, um, but it was so novel at the time, which is and when you think about it, super exciting to be a part of something like that. And again, a lot of luck and happenstance. It's, you know, as it relates to like when I was born, where I was, yeah. like, <laughs> there's no way I had a crystal ball of life as it were, but, um, you know, really making the most of that opportunity, despite the fact like, man, it's so funny, um, Sagar, just when family members, even at that time ask, so what are you doing? Wait, explain that to me again. Like there wasn't like- That question never stops, right? <laughs> it was, I know, seriously, even to this day, right? Um, but it was so much easier to say, oh, I'm in sales. Oh, I'm like, you know what I mean? So it, it was very interesting. So yeah. um, so fast forward a few years later, we really at that time, you know, we had close to a thousand people <clears throat> at the startup at the time. And, you know, in uh, 2003, we got acquired by um, Citrix. So literally overnight going from a small startup to 10,000 plus wow. employee company overnight. It's, there's a lot of um, kind of, uh, you know, small fish, big pond, elements uh and that just it it it, it was a, there's a lot of growing pains and they talk about being thrown into the deep end um and learning how to swim on the way yeah. down there's a, a lot of again even personal building blocks around my own career that went into a lot of um shaped and helped um as it relates to zoom and what we went through there too so that, that's incredible I, I have a quick question for you there back in that 2003 2005 era when when the acquisition was happening was there a recurring revenue model as we know it today in SaaS, monthly annual licenses, or was it more maintenance on-prem type of world? And I'm curious, what did that mean for your post-sales 
milestones, right? What were you trying to to track towards? What what was your your KPI? What was the outcome you're trying to hit? Yeah, so um, you know, uh, Citrix as a whole was traditionally an on-prem and or very hardware heavy company. And we were, when we were acquired, we were you know, kind of rebranded as Citrix Online. That And coming from the startup, we were purely a SaaS place that looking at um, ARR was kind of like our, our kind of true north as it relates to what we were doing. I will say that, you know, some, and I, I won't say that this is kind of like a, um, a success guide and or something to navigate towards, but we were not super tied into um, and I'll, we'll get to this. This will be like the broken record theme of this, our session today, but um, we were not super focused on um, revenue contribution and really what that meant as it relates to forecasting um, a recurring revenue business from a CS perspective. When I say CS perspective, really what you're doing day to day post sales, there's direct tie-ins to you know retention growth right. and really what that means as it relates to um, what's hopefully up into the right for the company. So um, as it relates to expectations as Citrix corporate as a whole, um, we were kind of defining our own way without a lot of guidance, knowing that, look, like they were kind of new to this SaaS game as well. And we were kind of helping blaze trails. Uh, but that was a part of, of of that learning experience as well. Gotcha. And what was the key driver? Was it retention? Was it making customers get onboarded quickly? Heavily, yeah, heavy on the kind of like the, um, the first part of the customer journey on the onboarding piece. Yeah. You know, in a lot of ways, and not to you know, um, you know, uh, to the you know detriment of of what we were doing by any means, but we we're very focused on the onboarding, as you mentioned. Um, also, kind of starting to really emphasize, especially um, later on, um, over the course of time, um, you know, value. We although we didn't call it that at that time, but thinking about what proactive engagement looked like, and are, you know, really thinking about are we just going through the motions as it relates to. Um, ticking a boxing that we did something versus like, okay, if we were to really ask the customer for, you know, whatever business review or whatever the engagement that we did, like, is it like, did this help in any way? Is this, you know, you know, are we exceeding your expectations, which I do feel even to the day and beyond, that is a very important element of what we're doing, sure. what we should be doing in CS, right? Yeah, totally. The point about onboarding and th you were onboarding a software solution, right? Or was this still a hardware hybrid yeah um it was not a hardware hybrid again you know being kind of like the the SaaS guiding light as it were through this acquisition and you know through the acquisition too we, our core competency was still focused on that SaaS platform Got it. Um, you know i would say not you know not unlike a lot of cs organizations starting out early on um and this will resonate with a lot of folks too we were wearing a lot of hats right and training was a part of of that initial CS offering, which over time, again, that kind of became, um, took a, a bit of a backseat with more specialized roles as we continue to evolve. But, um, you know, thinking about, you know, the whole jack of all trades analogies that we've all heard right. on that CS do, again, very training focused. And then later on thinking about more about proactive engagement, adoption, right. adoption was probably our core focus, um, especially as we started to evolve the platform. Um, and that's consistent across, um, you know, most SaaS companies, right? Yeah. Um, as you continue to get sticky and wide across your customer base. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's so, that's one of those, those key jobs to be done that I don't, I don't think has changed too much because even in the pure play SaaS world, there's still that first time to value or time to first value is so critical for the long-term retention and, and, the, and the lifetime value curve for the customer. Um, how many... I'm curious in terms of scale, you know, Citrix, massive company, you're probably onboarding huge organizations. How many people were you training? How many users were adopting the solution for a, for a specific deal? Um, it, it varied. I know, um, and it, man, it feels like so long ago, um, a lifetime ago almost, it kind of was. Um, you know, I, I think something that was important, and I'll answer this kind of like in parallel first, in that I, I think as it relates to the onboarding piece, we had to get our, and this evolved over time. It wasn't like we got this right overnight. Um, but the segmentation piece was super critical in that like, look, and I think this is kind of when I think about kind of the next anecdote or story that I'll talk about, you know, scaling CS for the masses is super important and you can't handhold every customer right. across every segment. Um, that goes for any sort of CS motion and or even supporting motion or training motion or those sorts of things. So, you know, as we continue to evolve and scale, like, look, you, 
you know, another consistent thing that, you know, I may talk about today as well is, you know, it's, it, you know, throwing headcount at problems doesn't scale either. And although, you know, CS is perpetually strapped for time and you're doing a lot of things, like where are you investing your most, most of your time, effort, and energy? And are you getting, um, are you reaping the rewards of those, AKA the lifetime value pieces? Is it, is it paying off? Um, looking at where you can automate at scale. And again, it was difficult. These were kind of difficult philosophies, not so difficult now, but difficult then to think about because automation tools, you know, even from a marketing engagement um, and think about some like the myriad of, um, you know, proactive marketing engagement tools and or CS tools that are at our disposal today. Um, all of that was still kind of being defined in parallel back then as well. So um, having that perspective, even early on, knowing like, look, even though it's easier said than done as it relates to throwing head counter problems, that was kind of <laughs> the, the kind of catch all solution. And, right. and unfortunately, if we weren't able to either hire to and or have coverage in certain segments, especially down market, um, you know, it's it's almost that whole squeaky wheel gets the grease and or the larger the customer, the more attention that will pay them, which in the end, that's it's somewhat counterintuitive too, because some of your biggest opportunities are your lowest spend customers. So um those are some of the things that we were thinking about. Again, more holistically, but I know your question was more around the onboarding piece, but again, it's very applicable yeah. throughout the customer journey. And it's such a contrast to what happened next in your career, which was CS for the enterprise at Citrix to then CS for the masses at Zoom, which totally different motion, totally different way that users are engaging with the solution. A lot more intuitive if, if you've used a, a software before right we're recording this on zoom people people know what it is in the in the day in, in today's age so let's let's shift gears and talk about that and specifically the moment i'm interested in is that critical phase right january 2020 pandemic starting to unfold everybody's trying to figure out what to do zoom is such the right solution at the right time for so many organizations and as you called it the zoom boom happens going from 10 million to 300 million users in three months, which is, you cannot wrap your mind around something like that. They're probably faster than open AI, right? Growth. And uh, what was the, what was the experience on the ground with customers like when you were, you had a few CSMs managing this group to then it ballooning over 30 X, right? What, what was the, the push and pull that was happening to make sure that customers were still using the solution correctly, getting value from it? Um, if you don't mind, I'll take a quick half step back. I, just as far as the transition to Zoom, it's like, why'd you join Zoom? For you sure, know, for I, sure. I, yeah, I yeah, go for it, go for it. seconds, but I still remember towards the later part of my career um, at Citrix and along the way, had a ton of opportunity as it relates to building teams and actually, um, you know, moving to uh, temporarily to the UK um, to build out some of our net new global teams, which is awesome. But I still remember, um, I think it was early in 2015, maybe even a little before the first time I used Zoom. I'm like, and I was thinking at that time, so I was using it with a colleague. And I remember like the words so clearly, like it was yesterday. I, was, I literally said, holy crap, we're in trouble. <laughs> From a, a competitive standpoint, thinking about how it's such an easy, intuitive product to use. And, and I think in a lot of ways, from a product direction standpoint, but not like a lot of companies at that time, we we're kind of all over the place where we were at at, at Strix, um, which is fine. But I, that was where the first time I experienced it for anyways, you know, fast forward um, to this next piece to your next question. Um, yeah, joined late 2015. And when you think about, um, you know, the onset of COVID late 2019 going into 2020, um, there wasn't a lot that we could do to mentally prepare other than me being obsessive about the things that we got right, but more importantly, obsessive about the things that we got or I got wrong at Citrix. That is, you know, and and, that, and when I say got wrong, and that's okay. And I think a lot of just in general, good leadership takes into account and really embraces the things that you could have done better, right? You know, there's something to be said about, um, you know, trial by fire and um, and um, growing pains, and they call it growing pains for reasons. You know, growing in general is is not easy and it can be painful. Um, but I do feel some of the obsessions that I had around, you know, doing things differently when I came to Zoom, namely, namely how can we scale CS, which was more traditionally when you think about proactive customer success related engagement was more reserved for higher spend customers. And yes, there's ways of monetizing CS, um, which we may or may not get into today, but in the end, traditionally CS was reserved for higher spend customers. And when you think about a companies like Zoom at that time that, you know, 
a lot of our sweet spot was for, you know, um, you know, SMB um, mid-market companies in addition to large enterprise customers. And when you think about um, how do we truly re-revolutionize what good looks like in the context of CS, that was one, like, think about one or two core focuses of mine coming on. That is, how do we provide that type of warm and fuzzy customer, and we think about customer happiness, which, you know, Zoom to this day is so obsessed about. Um, CS for the masses really came imperative to me. That is, how do we leverage tools, operations um, from the get-go and really create an environment where we're 100% tuned in at the best that we could as it relates to the health of our customers, um, you know, understanding what good adoption looks like. And it's not just about, okay, are they using it up into the right? Okay, we don't need to talk to them. But like more importantly, what are they not doing in our products, right? Um, and being maniacally focused about those things, I think in a lot of ways helped set us up for success during that quote unquote, what we enduringly called Zoom boom at the time. Right. In that like, if we weren't focused on those things, if we were just, you know, kind of doing the traditional um, CS segmentation thing and paying more attention to, you know, those top spend customers, you know, we could have easily failed, right? And that's not to say that, you know, we weren't, you know, flying by the seat of our pants, trying to hire very quickly and those sorts of things. There were some things that, you know, were done out of order, but I think without this fundamental building blocks as it relates to investing in operations and enabling our own folks for scale and automating where we could, especially in the mass market um, and engaging our customers in more thoughtful ways at, I can't imagine if we hadn't have done that. I think a lot of, you know, maybe three of the four wheels would have fallen off the car as it were, yeah. um, Sagar. But um, yeah, in the end, I, I, I feel like holistically, that's kind of what I was thinking about at that time as that was happening. Just, you know, being thankful that that was kind of just a core focus of ours very early on. It, it strikes me that the two worlds you were inhabiting CS for the enterprise where training was the most top priority. There's so many users had to onboard this complex solution to zoom where CS for the masses. It, it must've been a totally different way to engage your customers. And I'm curious what, what was the top priority at zoom, right? If, if onboarding and training and adoption was key at Citrix for the masses, CS masses play at zoom, what, what was that? What was that thing that you were going after maniacally every single day? Yeah, and I hate to, it, this hopefully this isn't um, kind of a boring, method, but I do feel like there's a lot of fundamental truths to this. And I feel like this is, when you look at the customer journey and it's very important, and I do feel, you know, our CEO and, and the founder of Zoom, Eric Yuan, um, you know, being an engineer at heart, he was very focused on product development, engineering efforts, getting, you know, time to value and, and onboarded very quickly. And I think early on, even his, um, and I know his mindset around, the value of CS changed over time as, as well. And when I departed Zoom, I was actually reporting directly to Eric um, when I left. And, you know, as even his own thought process around evolving, okay, onboarding, happy customers, that's all you need to do. <laughs> There's so much more to that when you think about it in the context of the traditional um, layer model, right? The TSIA, you know, land, adopt, expand, renew. In that look, you know, it's kind of half the battle, um, loosely speaking, of course, getting customers up and running. But when you think about the long tail effect as it relates, um, especially during the quote unquote zoom boom, you know, how quickly the exponential factor is as you continue to grow the base and how that impacts um, good or bad on a top line perspective quarter over quarter. Um, as you know, being a leader of your own company, um, Sagar, it, it can be great and or detrimental um, to your quarter over quarter growth. That is, if there's a small deviation um, of churn and or oh, huge great things like upsell happening. So when you think about, um, like I think you even alluded to it. I'm sorry that I may have missed it, but you know, going from a, a user base of 10 million to 300 million users from you know December 2019 to February of 2020, oh and what that means in the context of revenue. And it's it's not meant to be like oh poor Zoom, you're making you know money hand over fist, Jim. You had like the CS charmed life as it relates to like happy customers because you know. There were churn implications, and believe me, when you have customers that are not spending a ton of time, and not to say all customers were doing this, but there, the tendency was to kind of overbuy, and the, yes, we need all of this for our entire company, we'll think about implications later, but knowing that you know customers were in a moment's notice having to kind of rethink and or on the fly reshape what their work from home policies were and things of that nature, you know, uh, education, you know, work for, you know, learning from home, and think about anybody that either had children or friends with children, um, 
when we're learning firsthand, and especially during this time too, man, if, if you even Google like Zoom FTC or Zoom security, there were a lot of things happening in parallel, which I won't dive too deep into, but during the same time as, you know, we literally gave Zoom free to, you know, all EDU um, for right. those that didn't have it. We were really trying to like, help. it was a part of a, you know, a privilege is something that we're super, or I'm super proud about, you know, we're literally providing, um, you know, tools to kind of keep the world together and thinking about, you know, especially in the learning EDU K through 12 higher ed, um, nothing um, was more relevant at that time, especially in our children's lives as it relates to just continuous learning and, and what that meant to even socially connect Absolutely. Um, with their families. But at the same time, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, outside scrutiny happening as it relates to Zoom zone security practices. And a result of that was, um, you know, the their 20 year obligation to the FTC as far as continually evolving um, their product offerings, emphasizing security and privacy disclosures, you know, um, our encryption practices and things of that nature. Um, and at that time, it was an election year. And, you know, the partisan focus, a lot of, there's a lot of heavy emphasis on China. We think about the companies like ByteDance, TikTok. Yeah, the and, Zoom bombers, and, right? All these terms were being thrown oh, around. It was just like, <laughs> we were in the press constantly. And the reality was we were literally having these hand-to-hand -hand combat um, conversations with um, company leaders, CEOs, um, CISOs, nights, weekends, you name it. My goodness. As this whole Zoom boom phenomenon is happening, so when you think about just, um, if I had one word, chaotic, um, and I know I continue to be long-winded, but it's very um, chaotic, but I do feel there's a lot of, and we'll get into this in a bit, but a lot of parallels as it relates to the growth mindset. Like you had, a, a di and I still remember thinking back, like I have a distinct choice here. I can fold and, but like, I'm sitting here at home, like we're all working remote. Like what else would we be doing? <laughs> And we would often joke about that, even as a leadership team, like, yeah, this is pretty chaotic. This is extremely stressful, but what else would we be doing? Like, we're all sitting at home, kind of like trying to figure this um, from home thing out. So, um, it, and again, I know I'm, I've been a, a little bit all over the place here, but I really wanted to encapsulate just some of the sentiment and the emotion around what was really happening at that time uh, from a Zoom perspective. Yeah, that it, it's a story that I think very few people besides your team would have visibility into with a company that shaped a lot of our lives. I mean, I was using Zoom for work. I was using Zoom for my personal life. Everybody was, right? Everybody had interacted with Zoom through multiple channels over the course of that two years. So to and bring this home back to your question, I, I do feel just with some of the things I was, you know, maniacally focused about coming to Zoom. Those are a lot of the foundational building blocks and elements that were so important that, you know, and think about in retrospect, if we weren't have, if we, if we hadn't have got it, not to say we got things perfectly, but if those things weren't emphasized, um, I don't think we would have had that continued success over time. Um, again, focused on, you know, scaling for the map, which again, helped in the long run, even, and there's so many different ways you can leverage um, good, thoughtful, automated engagement, whether you're leveraging, you know, things like AI, and or just outbound activity, things of that nature across all segments. It's not just a mass market versus enterprise game um, whatsoever. So there's, again, a lot of long-term learnings there. But again, I think even as, um, you know, as, even as our, um, you know, extended leadership teams all the way up to Eric's idea of the value of CS and what that looked like, again, in his mind, being maniacally focused on customer happiness, some of those things, including, you know, and just to, just to be super clear here, renewals was under our umbrella as well. So being a hundred percent focused and understanding the importance of you know things like revenue contribution, having a proper quarter over quarter forecast, knowing that look for all intents and purposes, the renewals book of business was greater than any of the top line sales forecast or goals totally. as well. <laughs> we had the biggest number at the company. And at the end of the day, think about when I departed last July, you know, we had roughly, um, you think about at that time, we were about a $4 billion company. Half of that was our online business and transactional smaller um, um, uh, business. And the other half was under my umbrella. And when you think about just the, the context and the gravity of that, um, with customers coming out of COVID and thinking about the questions around, do we need all this that we bought? in 2020. And if we didn't, there's a lot of things at play. It wasn't just like, oh, CS saved the day, you know, as because things like, um, you know, short-term churn implications and things of that nature, we did see, you know, spikes one, two, three years into that. But thinking about as we continue to stay close to our customers 
And with that direct feedback, being able to funnel that into our product teams and really evolve the product. And when you think about the core suite of products around the Zoom platform today, it's much bigger than just, you know, the, the video or we're just that video company, right? Um, and I think a lot goes into when you think about continually adding value over time, a lot of it has to do with that product and finding ways of like, in some ways we CS teams should be looking at like, okay, um, over time, as companies mature, their business objectives can change. And oftentimes having conversations around repurposing spend, even though it takes a lot of effort, um, a lot of it does tie into For kind sure. of retaining and even incrementally growing the, the base too. Um, yeah. Which is it, super important. It, it's, it's really fascinating. The, the number of times you mentioned that, um, external factors were shaping your your reality on the ground, right? The chaos from FTC and from politics and government. So how did, tell me a story about how did your team, you know, maintain the focus on that revenue contribution component of making sure that account renewed and ensured that they were getting value with all these external shocks coming in, right? Was that part of the conversation and saying, hey, we're, we're managing all this, we have a plan for it. And that helped instill confidence in the customer to renew or or was it, was it a distraction, right? And, and I'm really interested in ultimately what was the, what were those revenue conversations like you know, with the champions at, at your enterprise it's, customers? It's both a distraction and and I think a lot of it had to do with how our company was, um, as it relates to customer success, how our teams were structured. Um, we we're tightly aligned with um, the revenue function of the of our org. So um, for I would say a good majority of our time, you know, our business was run through our office of the CRO. And just extreme tight alignment with um, sales and just revenue contribution as a whole. So we participated, for instance, on you know weekly forecast calls, things of that nature. So I do feel, even from like an executive sponsorship perspective, that more so than I had experienced in my past life at Citrix and the startups before. You know, there's and again, not to say it was perfect, but more of a focus around um, alignment um, around the customer and thinking about you know, where touch points were happening um, and, you know, thinking about, um, you know, areas in which we were adding value beyond the traditional means of looking at, you know, adoption metrics and things of that nature. Because again, I think we've seen time and time again, like, you know, surprises that may happen with customers that come to you and say, hey, I don't want to renew. Like, wait, what do you mean? You know, like your adoption, like in the end, the adoption doesn't tell that, that story. Um, um Sometimes it can, but I would say more often than not, it's, it has very little to do sometimes with customer buying decisions. Um, but I do feel having well-defined swim lanes, especially cross-functionally, is super important. Um, and oftentimes I feel like sometimes CS can get a bit lost in the mix. And when you think about, and again, we'll talk about more of the future of CS and kind of what that means. But I do feel that those teams that do struggle are comes from leadership that may not truly understand, okay, what's your role? Like, what are you providing as a CSM or as a renewals manager? Like, don't we have that in sales? Don't we have that in our professional services? So without that, um, you know, especially during a time um, that we were experiencing with the rapid growth, I think we would have struggled otherwise. Um, but I do feel, and not to say like, um, this has to be, you know, the blueprint at other companies where that's going to work perfectly, but I do feel it's super important um, regardless of how your, your team is structured to have, you know, those clear swim lanes, roles, responsibilities, but also have that clear tie in, um, to revenue contribute. And we, you talk a lot about value yourself as far as providing for, you know, customers in the context of your own product, but think about even internally, what value you're bringing to the table as it relates to the revenue contribution number, um, whether it's, um, you know, uh, growth, um, net revenue retention, gross, the gross number, whatnot, it's all super important. And then it's demonstrated and it's part of being a leader is yeah. being comfortable and, you know, reporting back up and ensuring that that's crystal clear. Totally. And there's, there's two dimensions of value. There's the external value that your customers are receiving from your solution. But there's also the internal value that yeah. your team has to be able to justify and prove to leadership and connect back to revenue contributions. And I want to take this in a direction that I know you're particularly passionate about and also connects to our third story here is how to set up the team for success. But that ultimately comes from instilling a growth mindset top down from the leadership, walking the walk and setting the example for, for how to, for how to perform in your, in your job. So talk to us about the growth mindset, team first mindset that you developed both at Citrix and at Zoom 
that ultimately led to success of your of your team's performance. But before that, what was some of the mental model that had to come together in order to create the environment that was right for your CS team to to do their jobs? Yeah, I think this, um, and again, the recipe is going to be different for a lot of folks that you talk to, but I, I do feel that just there's some universal truths here as it relates to just my own journey. And I think a lot of what I'll talk about over the course of the next couple of minutes is true for me, uh, even outside of the professional life. And I feel like, again, there's a lot of universal truth here, but um, you know, there's a quote I probably overused in the past, but um, you know, nothing of significance in life is ever accomplished alone. Um, it comes from a guy named John Maxwell. Um, I've heard everybody from, you know, Tom Brady use this. I apologize if you're not a Tom Brady fan, but, you know, other folks use it as well. But I, I do feel that, you know, being rooted in team and having the utmost accountability from the top down is super important. And I think the not so secret of my success um, and not just my success and other leaders that I truly admire as well, whether it's, you know, someone like an Eric Yuan um, is having folks with that growth mindset that are yeah, there's a time and a place for delegation and things like that. But if there's something that experiencing something, especially at Zoom during 2019 and 2020, even as a senior leadership team from the top down, you know, we were literally hand in hand with our extended frontline teams um, on the front lines, working directly with our customers um, on behalf uh, of the team. And it really a, a kind of like a, 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 a selfless environment to be a part of. And a lot of learnings and just experiencing that firsthand is um, the art of learning, uh, you know, leading by example. And I feel like, you know, surrounding yourself with great teammates and even this goes even to even, and I know that what I'm about to say, it's very wishy-washy. It's hard to like quantify what you're saying. What are you saying, Jim? Um, <laughs> looking at even in your hiring practices, it's one thing to um, look at job qualifications. Okay. He ticks all the boxes, but something's off, you know, and i and if one person is going to listen to this podcast, Catherine, she'll laugh at me um, if she hears me say this one more time, but always trust your gut. And I do feel like over time, your gut instincts can evolve and change and get more fine tuned. But there are a lot of intangibles around hiring the right people, those that truly have that um, you know, similar mindset. And this goes for individual contributors and leadership alike, but it really pays off in the long run, especially as it relates to really rooting yourself personally and professionally in these values and that, you know, trust in one another is paramount. It's, it's the key to, um, you know, it was the key to our success. And um, we talked a lot about a specific, you know, book at that time um, um, by Covey, The Speed of Trust. And there's a lot of elements to just life, again, life parallels too. That is in any relationship, you know, if you don't have that trust and that there's doubt um, and, if, you know, have if you've been burned in past experience with either internal teammates, things of that nature, and if there's a lack of that, there's a lot of fundamental things that break down. And it ties directly into execution on the front lines with your customers. So um, I'm a huge team guy. Um, you know, I, I hate a strong word, but I help, I hate selfish teammates. And that, that goes for leadership alike, um, including myself. And I, I do feel with celebrating success together that there's an accountability piece um, that comes with servant leadership and leading by example and really doing our best um, to empower others, um, especially with customers and truly owning outcomes together, that that needs to be a necessary part of whatever you're doing, um, whether you're at a rapid scale company or not. Um, and things can ebb and flow over time. But I do feel just to kind of sum up um, our blueprint for success. And again, if any ex CS Zumi, they'll probably remember the slide because I've I, I used to, you know, sing this to the count, uh, saying this to the cows come home, but, you know, along with that growth mindset, having that core focus and everything that we were doing from a metric standpoint or methodology standpoint, um, aligning to retaining and growing the base, um, that was, that was our true north. Um, so again, a lot of learnings through Citrix and as far as like things that we could have gotten better, but again, not to say I'm giving myself a pass here, but again, software as a service, again, being so new at that time too. Um, I do feel fortunate just from a happenstance and luck perspective to be a part of not just the growth of Zoom and the company like Citrix as it relates to their SaaS business, but just being in that kind of era, as it were, of, um, you know, consumers, whether, you know, from the enterprise oh, no. consumers or businesses as a whole, moving from just like, you know, localized software to actually having something that can rapidly grow and evolve with their business needs as well. So. And the growth mindset, I'm sure, gets tested because the company's growing so quickly in that Zoom boom time frame. We often talk about at Foresight, this concept of a stress test is 
if you have a hypothesis, a framework, a process, well, whenever the unexpected happens, let's say me and my co-founder are both out, right? Is this system still going to work? Or in this case, you have this growth mindset, what you've inculcated with your team, and then you grow 30x in your user base in three months. Is that still going to 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 live on and right and and if it does then I think it's a testament to the strength of of the um, underlying principles which it seems like so that was so critical to your time at, at Zoom with yeah it's uh, just the round everything. challenges help us grow and I think that's to me one of the one of the many facets of growth mindset that are super important and I think I may have alluded to this um, several minutes ago but you know growing pains are just that they're somewhat painful but again learning to be and I think I'm cliching myself to death here but you know, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. That, that had, had a lot to do um, with anybody's personal growth and our growth at Zoom and or, you know, insert whatever company in the blank that you'd like. Um, it's super, super important. And it's key to our own, like I said, personal growth as well. And I think there's so many parallels that transcend the walls of whatever workplace that you're in, um, you know, both you know, virtually and, and physically, so. And it, I'm sure you'll continue to add to that list of principles with, all the work that you'll be doing in, in your consulting, advising, and probably sharing with with founders and companies you're, you're working with. So it's great to see it all uh, continue to, to iterate and evolve, um, just like a company does. Um, yeah, so I want to, yeah, I want I want to shift over to the next section of our show here, which is an audience favorite, and I know you're eager to uh, <laughs> respond to a couple of these questions. Uh, we call it the rapid fire section. So I'm going to ask you eight questions, Jim, and I'm going to put you in a bit of a bind here you only have one or two words to respond to the question if you want to add more context feel free you can definitely do that but what is the first concept that comes to your mind when i ask you this question right that's the rules of the game we're going to get started here with the first question break the rules and i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> i'll give you a pass um what is the best metric of success for cs Sub this is subjective so if you want to think about one word i just want to preface it by saying but i do feel um, it, layered in what we talked about today, revenue, something tied to revenue contribution and customer value, full stop. Um, now comes the, the supplementary um, disclaimer here. First, you know, understanding your company business from a finance perspective, it is super, super important. Um, and again, I apologize for kind of derailing the rapid fire in the spirit of the rapid fire, but this comes down to what I feel kind of like are the holy trinity of really important metrics. And it's when you're know, boiling it down to three things, I think is as simple as I can do it. Um, but, you know, forecasting renewals in general, even if you don't have renewals under your CS umbrella, understanding what's at stake on a quarter to quarter basis um, from a revenue contribution perspective is super important. Um, number two, adoption. It comes in lots of flavors. And I know that's that maybe a, um, a buzzword as it relates, but understanding and having a keen understanding of what your customers are doing in your product and more importantly, what they're not doing in your product, like that is paramount as it relates to a lot of things, including, you know, product evolution, things of that nature. And then number three of the Trinity, understanding, you know, again, your mileage varies with these buzzwords, but sentiment and value, right? Um, are your customers referenceable and are they helping you drive the overall product direction and things of that nature? Uh, there isn't a magic best metric of CS. And I feel like, it, you know, in the spirit of the game, yeah, I'll give you a couple of words as it relates to revenue contribution and value. Um, but at the end of the day, there's, you know, the, good looks has various different forms um, across whatever company that you may be at. But I do feel fundamentally and universally that quote unquote holy trinity of sorts is super, super important. It's a... Uh... You 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 expanded the answer here, but I think there's we'll we'll call it three words, right? Forecasting, adoption, and sentiment. I know I already felt it. <laughs> but uh, no, I think it's a really great way of, of framing it up for folks. Um, we're gonna go to the converse here and ask you, Jim, what is the worst metric of success for CS? Oh, uh, I got um, ruffle some feathers here, but a just generalized health score that you may have in your insert the blank, you know, CS CRM. Um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> You're not alone there. Uh, what is the most underrated part of CS? Um, emphasizing and or limiting overlapping roles and responsibilities across all customer facing teams. Okay. What about the most overrated part of CS? Um, 
customer engagement and or customer engagement metrics for the sake of completing a personal MBO? That is a really good one. Uh, I know a lot of folks who get stressed out about meeting this activity metrics when that has no correlation to revenue. What is the... <laughs> yeah, ask your customers, do you, do you want to be doing this? Yeah. But anyways, for the sake it might, of it might be money. inversely related. You're hitting me up too much. I don't want to work with you anymore. I'll go to a different, different company. Yeah. Uh, next question here is, what is the current state of CS? My answer here is, um, I don't mean to scare folks, but I, I say current state of CS can be scary for some um, that may not have their teams rooted in some of the foundational things we've been talking about today. Um, and not to say I you know, have everything figured out, but in the end, it, it can be scary for some. And I see it. You see it. We all see it in a lot of the dialogue that we're seeing on things like LinkedIn and what that truly means in the case of you know things like layoffs and, right. and the deification in some arenas as it relates to CS, right? Yeah. People saying is asking if CS is dead, right? That, that these questions come up from time to time. Well, if the current state is scary, what is the future of CS? Um, it's continually evolving and it's never not going to be that. And I do feel, again, I'll leave it. I'll try to keep things short. But again, a lot of what we talked about today really ties into that future and being prepared for that future, right? And scaling with what that looks like. So definitely. All right. What is the best CS book slash podcast? <laughs> it's, this is the one that I'll have more than a couple words. Um, <laughs> number one, it's not a CS book. You're like, Damn it, Jim. <laughs> You're so counterculture here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, and not to be redundant, and I apologize if, if this is a rerun for someone. I actually um, mentioned this book on a prior um, CS related podcast, but it's, you know, Rick Rubin of all people has a book and it's called The Creative Act, A Way of Being. Um, and a lot of the, the, the dialogue in the book is about evolving your mindset and focus and and tying into a lot of the sentiment that we actually talked about today, um, not so surprisingly. And um, what that truly translates for me and thinking about just several anecdotes that we've talked about today and stories, but um, the book is rooted thematically in the concept of continuous learning. And I think that's super important for any leader in and out of CS, but it's super important, I feel, for all leaders and or aspiring leaders like, you know, continual, whether you're and we think about continual life and a professional journey, learning opportunities. This is not a destination game that we're in, um, Sagar, or it shouldn't be. Um, like, I, you know, until the day I die, I want to be in this mindset of continually being open to growing and learning and understanding different ways of doing things. Um, there's a lot of fulfillment there. I love it. And I've never heard of that book, but I think that is a, I love the orthogonal answers to this question. And I'm sure people will, we have to link it in the comments for people to have easy access to it. Uh, sure. Final question here for the rapid fire section is what is the best community for CS leaders that you've been a part of? So again, I'll deviate a little bit and something I will, that I've found some value from it that's relatively new. It's actually a, a newsletter, if you don't mind me plugging, but it's from yeah, a fellow works. peer and CS leader, Jay Nathan. I think you may have um, been recently introduced to him. Yes. Um, and um, great guy, uh, more, first and foremost, awesome friend, but respected leader in the space. He has a relatively new newsletter, but he's a part of a couple communities as well. Um, but very topical newsletter that's been going out. Um, and you can sign up at that, uh, a company called growthcurve.io. Um, and we can link to that as well, but um, very topical. A lot of the things that we've talked about today thematically um, he's touched on, that is, you know, some of the challenges around CS, the revenue piece, having a good understanding of from a finance perspective, what's important to the business and kind of how to tie in um, all of that, those customer facing things that we want to aspire to as a CS org to really tie that back to the nuts and bolts of the business. Um, he's had a lot of great discussion around that as of late. So love it. Big fan of Jay Nathan. Now we have a, a a more aspirational question, rhetorical question, which is we're, we're calling this future customer value, right? We think about the future a lot. And so I want to ask you to think about the future, Jim. And if you could make one prediction about where we're headed as an industry, it could be CS specific, it could be SaaS industry specific, but where are we going? Where is the world evolving to and how are we going to need to adapt to, to keep up with it? Yeah, it's around us today. And I think we've heard it time and time again. And this, my answer isn't so surprising. Um, 
but thinking about you know AI and what that means in the context of what we're doing with our customers. And I feel like things that I've seen some other companies do, whether they're you know marketing engagement apps, um, and just when you think about just customer engagement as a whole, sales, marketing, CS, you name it, there's a huge opportunity to kind of rethink what scalability scalability looks like as it relates to what good from a um, just day-to-day -day motion as it relates to, um, you know, go-to-market strategies looks like. Um, and, we, you know, when I we talked about Zoom and having kind of like the building blocks and what what looked good then, you know, four plus years ago around tools and automation, um, there's a huge opportunity as it relates to leveraging AI. Across, and and I'll, I'll give an example, right? And I think um, oftentimes when you think about customer sentiment and or measurability that that lies there within you know for better or for worse metrics like nps can be you know kicked around as it relates to like okay what's the real the real time sentiment look like or customer feedback and i do feel that there's been a lot of gaps with that historically in that you know uh you know from a methodology standpoint some leaders may not buy into that and i I've, I've talked to many of them um Number two is that, you know, it's very linear in that, look, um, oftentimes if people are giving feedback, they're either really happy or really pissed off. And, and or when you're sending out a survey or popping something within your product, um, oftentimes that's a small time and place versus um, a more fluid opportunity to gather data, whether they're calling into support or, you know, having a, 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 a you know, participating in a, a customer advisory board event being led by your chief um, product officer. There's lots of customer touch points that have historically been kind of lost in the mix of like the data thing, right? And not being able to kind of translate it in real time. So you know, there's lots of companies that I think are doing a better than good job of really plugging in what and, and really surfacing that real time sentiment and feedback. Um, in a, in a better, more efficient way. And again, historically, these are things that we would have to like either throw tools and or process. And again, AI is a tool of sorts as it were, but um, you know, we see have program managers that were driving primary, you know, NPS programs and things of that nature. When you think, you know, 10 plus years ago, whereas I feel like there's a huge opportunity now to really have those real time data insights to drive things like engagement strategies, having your CS CRM of choice, you know, pop alerts to you as a CSM or as a renewals manager or as a support agent, what have you, to really have more poignant, meaningful engagement opportunities. Um, you know, think about um, propensity to upsell as well. This isn't just a risk mitigation game, right? And I think that's a, a huge opportunity as well to be leveraging, um, you know, AI embedded products to be able to help better surfaces. But again, this transcends, yeah. So I think about um, what we talked about before about, you know, clear lines of engagement across all of your go-to-market teams. Um, having that defined and a plan, that is your future roadmap to see us. Um, and I feel it's imperative that you're not just thinking about it, but you're having active conversations and making plans to either evolve what you're doing today and or having plans in place to um, really kind of change the guard as it relates to what your tactical hand-to-hand -hand, um, engagement strategies may look like today with your customers. Yeah, I've been in numerous conversations with companies who are actively deploying models that they've built, that tools they're using. And we see it everywhere in, in call transcripts, right? And AI transcripts that are suggesting actions. And I think figuring out what is the right highest impact human touch versus a digital touch that can come from a automation. What What is that customer journey going to look like? And how, how is that going to ultimately um, identify the key areas that you can add value? So it's fascinating and i think we need to do another deep dive in three months six months because the world will have changed again you know and, and I'm, with some of your other involvements i'm, I'm sure that um you know we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a, a unique perspective on how ai is changing the game here so this has been incredible jim i am so excited that we were able to chat and we're nearing the end of our show here i want to leave the audience with one final question for you and um, it's really about how can they contact you, right? We, we've had a great chat. If folks want to dig deeper with you about any of your responses or just to connect with you and and um, build a relationship with you, um, how can they do that? Yeah, I'd say just universally, LinkedIn is probably best. Um, and, you know, I'm open to chat with with anybody. Um, so shoot me a DM on my name is, it, by search, the Jim Mercer, or and we'll provide you with the link, but it's just um, LinkedIn slash in slash J Mercer, the letter J in Mercer, my last name. So yeah, happy to chat um, 
I do it often week to week. And um, it's been fun, even though, uh, like we talked about before, not having necessarily um, a full-time gig as it were, but it's allowed me to really um, have more of a consultative approach to, you know, doing things like this, podcasts, conversations, some of those uh, investment opportunities that I've been a part of. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. So again, really appreciate the time today. Absolutely. Love to hear it. I'm sure it'll be in touch through the numerous channels and maybe more uh, content to do uh, partner up on as well. But thank you so much again, Jim, for all of your time today. And I look forward to sharing this with the audience. You can check out the show on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on our new Spotify podcast channel as well. And please let us know what you think. If you have any questions, we can bring Jim on for part two. So with that, we'll close it out. Thanks so much. And we'll, we'll talk soon, Jim. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by Foresight. If you're interested in learning more, please email them at info at gainforesight.co. That is info at G-A-I-N-F-O-R-E-S-I-G-H-T dot C-O. Thank you.